tonight, another day of protests on the steps of the Confederation Building. It's not only boat and crab, just about everything we fish for. We need free enterprise. Fish and crab harvesters continue pushing government to open the market to outside buyers. And tonight he's here in Gander appealing to the people of central Newfoundland. I'm Troy Turner and I'll have more live tonight from Quality Inn. Two and a half million tons of road salt produced each year on the west coast. I think there's a, a, lot, of, a lot of bang for the buck with this one. I'll tell you the latest about this multi-million dollar project for St. George's. This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. We begin on the west coast of the island this evening where human remains have been found in a wooded area near St. George's. According to the RCMP, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner is working to determine that person's identity. No other details are known at this time, but we'll continue to follow this story. In other news, fish protests continued today as the House of Assembly debated what to do. One of the requests from fishermen is to allow outside buyers. But as here now, as Peter Cowan reports, politicians warn that allowing, allowing companies from outside the province could create other issues. Protesters took the fight today to the provincial fisheries office. Fish harvesters are frustrated. They say there are way too many restrictions on who they can sell their catch to. We got the plants telling us when to come when to go, how much we got to bring, and what they're going to give us first. You got no competition, you got no free enterprise. It's, it's as simple as that. They want to be able to sell to more plants in this province, but also allow buyers in from outside. It's common in other provinces, but banned here. That policy is designed to make sure that their catch isn't just caught here, but processed here as well. The fisheries minister says changing that rule could put 6,500 processing jobs at risk. It is my responsibility, the Premier's responsibility, to sit at the table and determine the benefits of and against uh, free enterprise. Do you believe in free enterprise in our fishing industry? The, the Progressive Premier. Conservatives are supporting the fishermen, introducing a motion today asking the Premier and Fisheries Minister to intervene to ensure the fishing season goes more smoothly than last year when disgruntled harvesters were tied up for weeks. But leader Tony Wakeham sidestepped the question of whether he'd support opening up the market to outside companies. Should fishermen be able to sell to buyers from outside of the province? Well, you know, if that's an option, there's another option. But I think for us, the, the biggest option is, you know, when we talk about capacity, when we talk about processing is, do we have enough capacity? The Premier says he's willing to look at allowing outside buyers, but only if there's a proposal from the FFAW union. It represents both fishermen and plant workers, so it's not clear if the union would be willing to make a change that could help some members while leading to less work for others. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. A court case that started in the west end of St. John's and stretched more than halfway across the country is reaching its conclusion. Sheldon Hibbs was charged with second degree murder more than a year ago. This afternoon, he agreed to plead guilty to a lesser charge. Elizabeth Witten has that story. This afternoon, in a nearly empty St. John's courtroom, Sheldon Hibbs pleaded guilty to manslaughter. It was two years ago this month that police charged him in connection with the 2021 killing of Michael King. He was initially charged with second degree murder, but today he agreed to a deal and a lesser charge. Police discovered King's body on a trail between Waterford Valley High School and Holbrook Avenue in the West End of St. John's on May 30th, 2021. In February of 2022, the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary issued a Canada-wide arrest warrant for Hibbs, who was found in Alberta. Access to information requests revealed that the RNC chartered a $91,000 flight from Calgary to return Hibbs to this province, saying at the time he was banned from commercial flights. Hibbs was set to go to trial before a jury, but that was halted in February, before it even started when Hibbs decided to change his plea. This afternoon, Hibbs was taken back into custody. He will be back in court on June 18th for sentencing submissions. Elizabeth Witten, CBC News, St. John's. 
Official opposition leader Pierre Poiliev is back in Newfoundland and Labrador trying to drum up support. This ahead of a possible 2025 federal election. He's in Gander tonight for a meet and greet. And Troy Turner is at the Quality Hotel and that's where Poiliev's event is taking place. So Troy, what's happening there now? Well, people are starting to trickle in here now for the event. Polyev is scheduled to speak at around 7. Now, this, week, this event has been planned for weeks. Of course, it comes on the heels of Premier Andrew Fury's letter to the Prime Minister. That's where he's calling for a pause to the carbon tax that is scheduled for April 1st. Fury is just one of seven premiers who wrote letters to Trudeau asking for the pause. Letters came from all Atlantic Canadian provinces, as well as Ontario, Saskatchewan and Alberta. The looming carbon tax hike is nearly 25 percent, and Fury says people in this province can't afford it. Of course, this isn't the first time Newfoundland and Labrador has asked the carbon tax be frozen or even removed. The tax is meant to incentivize people to move to renewable energy options. But Fury argues the province doesn't have the right infrastructure to support that change. Speaking earlier today, Trudeau called out what he called short-term thinker politicians asking for the pause. Does anyone really think you can build a strong economy for the future without at the same time fighting climate change and being responsible about the environment? The fact is you cannot. You can't have a plan for the economy if you don't have a plan to fight climate change. So then the question becomes, well, how do you fight climate change? There are lots of different ways you can do it. You can bring in the heavy hand of regulations to force people to do different things. You can bring in um, you know, different uh, incentives and subsidies and rewards to you know, invest in companies that are actually doing the right kinds of things. But that all involves the heavy hand of government weighing in on how we're going to do that. I prefer a cleaner solution. The carbon tax is a major talking point for Pierre Polyev. He's campaigning against it, and he said he'll force multiple votes in Parliament next week to stop what he's calling a Trudeau April Fool's tax hike. Now, Carolyn, all we have is spoken about the carbon tax in previous visits to the province, and you can bet that it's going to be one of the topics that he'll speak about here tonight. Now, he is urging supporters to put their pressure on MPs by phone calls and letters and even protest against the carbon tax. So we'll have more on what he has to say tomorrow night on Here and Now. But for now, reporting live, I'm Troy Turner in Gander. Well, it's been a bit of an unsettled day across uh, a good chunk of the island. Some sun, some clouds, some snow, some rain uh, pretty much everywhere and uh, even up across Labrador as well. We've got an area of low pressure just to the south there and uh, it is bringing some showers at the moment uh, and some flurry, some wet pavement out there, uh, mainly for the western portion of the province. But like I said, we did see some sunshine earlier today. Just taking a look at some of the cameras out there. Grand Falls, Windsor, Springdale, all showing some wet pavement, uh, Porter report showing some fog and Daniels Harbor actually you can see a little bit of sunshine there at the moment and uh, if we take a live look outside <laughs> St. John's uh, the fog is here or as other people like to call it the snow eater and uh, we've got that visibility down to about 0.6 kilometers at the airport too so more widespread areas uh, seeing that fog Minus one is the current conditions in St. John's, but we do have some freezing drizzle in that onshore flow up through northern portions of Labrador as well, Makovic. You will see that end, though, over the next couple of hours, but we do have some unsettled weather continuing across the province. I'll get into all of that when I come back. The man behind a controversial St. John's HVAC company is defending his business record in the wake of a CBC News investigation. There was very many satisfied customers and from a portfolio of a thousand, you, you're probably going to find, yeah, 100 customers that have come together and, and stated that they're upset about X, Y, and Z, but you're also going to find 500 customers that are like, you know what, my service was top notch. But customers have been venting online for months about their experiences with Atlantic Standard HVAC. 
constantly getting texts and calls and messages and there's definitely a lot of very upset and very frustrated people. Well, coming up in 20 minutes, our CBC Investigates reporter Ariana Kelland will delve into the background of the company's owner, Raymond Kalonga, and his financial troubles in this province and beyond. Well, back to the island's west coast, a company wants to put a $480 million mine in St. George's. The Great Atlantic Salt Project wants to produce millions of tons of road salt each year and ship it to parts of Canada and the United States. Here and now is Colleen Connors has that story. Road salt, something people in this province are very familiar with. Now, a large company wants to mine salt in St. George's, ship it by conveyor belt to the deep water port of Turf Point, and sell it to parts of the province, Quebec, and states along the eastern seaboard. It's called the Great Atlantic Salt Project. If we're selling two and a half million tons of salt at, uh, call it 70 bucks Canadian per ton, we're generating a lot of uh, money for the local economy. Uh, and as we talked about before, we're, we'll be employing at least 170 people in permanent full-time jobs when the mine is operating and, and a number more than that during the construction phase. And a number of residents who showed up to public consultations are in favour. The mine will be a couple hundred metres underground. The whole project will take up 80 hectares during construction, 40 once complete. In an area Federico says isn't forested, isn't used for trapping or hunting, and has no snowmobile or ATV trails. Federico says the mine's greenhouse gas emissions are nil. I think that the government numbers are that uh, the average family of four in Newfoundland produces around 200 to 250 tons of uh, greenhouse gas emissions on an annual basis, and our mine will produce a little over 900. Dust and noise are the biggest deterrents. But he says there's a plan for that too, a two-kilometer electric conveyor system through the town to get the salt to port. It'll be covered its entire way, so uh, there shouldn't be any fugitive dust from the conveyor. An environmental approval registration has been made with the province, and a decision is expected next month. Federico is quick to say that this is not a salt dome, more of a flat deposit stressing that there is no correlation with World Energy GH2 and its plan to store carbon dioxide in salt caverns in Fishel's Brook. Now it's time for the public to weigh in on the Great Atlantic Salt Project. The Environment Minister will make a decision in April. If approved, Federico says contractors could be hired by the end of this year and the five-year construction project can begin. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. Well, staying in the Bay St. George region, our CMP say for a second time, the World Energy GH2 meteorological data site has been vandalized. That site is located in mainland. A number of solar panels, windows and various other equipment was damaged late last month. Our CMP believe it happened between February 21st and 22nd when someone caused more than $5,000 worth of damage. Last January, some heavy equipment at the site was targeted by vandalism. Handles. Anyone with information is asked to contact police. Well, trappers in Labrador are sounding the alarm over the moose population. They're concerned the animals could go the way of the caribou. As Heidi Adder reports, the province says it still needs more data to confirm the numbers, and trappers could play a role in that. Labrador has a problem right now. Jim Schaus's workshop is full. It's the end of wolf trapping season, and he's preparing his furs, as well as others from Cartwright and Labrador West to head to auction. Schaus has no trouble finding wolves in Labrador, but moose, he says, are a different story. I don't want the moose to go the same way as, as what happened to our caribou. I mean, that was, that was horrific. Schaus isn't sure why, but speculates there may be too many licenses and that predators like these may be part of the problem. Caribou populations are still vulnerable, and Schaus says he and other trappers worry the wolves are turning their attention to the moose. I mean, a pack of those are probably going to have a moose a week. So, and there's packs of, uh, there's packs of wolves, you know, all over Labrador. So the moose, they don't get a chance to recover. 
parts of the North offer incentives, $1,200 for a wolf carcass, more if the pelt is prepared traditionally. Show says a similar program here could help bring down the numbers. In Labrador, all wolf skulls must be submitted to the Wildlife Division. The most a trapper will earn for a skull and carcass is about $60. And many, Shouse included, aren't doing it. But researchers with the Department of Forestry, Fishery and Agriculture say participation is key to understanding the population. Wayne Barney says there's always been fewer moose in Labrador. The majority of it is not part of their prime habitat. The animals are also hard to track and survey, which is where Barney hopes trappers can help. Currently, the number of harvesters submitting returns in Labrador is not high enough to draw reliable conclusions on our under success rates. So we encourage uh, all hunters and trappers to take an active role and provide to us their observations. Shouse isn't on board. He says the province is paying pennies when you consider the time it takes to trap a wolf, and if the province wants more information, it should compensate those doing the work. So for now, they're at a stalemate, a disappointment for Shouse, who worries central and northern Labrador will lose the few moose it has left. We get all, all, all this year to plan until, you know, until the hunting season rolls around again next November. So uh, now is the time to plan. Heidi Adder, CBC News, Happy Valley, Goose Bay. I don't think anybody can consider themselves, you know, safe when you're a journalist or a photojournalist these days. So, you know, we, you know, we kind of knew that there's some issues, but uh, we didn't think it was quite uh, this bad. Saltwire Network is filing for bankruptcy protection. We'll hear from a longtime local photojournalist at the Telegram. That's ahead. We've got some fog uh, for parts of St. John's, other parts of the Avalon seeing some sunshine as the sun sets. We'll talk about what's on the way when I come back.
This weather update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. The bonus prize deadline is midnight, Friday, April 12th. Order tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. Well, Ash, it was another kind of spring-like day in St. John's. <laughs> Saw some sunshine this afternoon. It was lovely. Yeah, spring-like for sure. And then, as uh, spring often does, bring that uh, fog out there as well. Today, for portions of the province, particularly here in St. John's, but you head out to CBS or along the south coast uh, of the uh, Avalon, southern portions of the Avalon, rather, uh, we're seeing some nicer weather for sure. Temperatures today topped out at 3 degrees in St. John's. Cape Race, 4 degrees. Degrees, and really anywhere along the or away from that onshore flow is seeing some pretty nice uh, spring like temperatures. Five degrees in Burgio, six in Stephenville. But then you head up towards uh, and along the northeast coast, those temperatures uh, topping out anywhere from zero to about two degrees through the day. Uh, that's the story up across Labrador as well. Makovic has been sitting around minus one for most of the day, along with some freezing drizzle. The freezing drizzle will eventually end as we head into the evening hours tonight as uh, conditions will improve. Now, temperatures have dropped just a little bit up across the Big Land, uh, down to a minus two in Makovic, three degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay at the moment. And we've got those temperatures anywhere from about minus one to plus two, but uh, warmest in Stephenville at the moment at about five degrees. Uh, but you factor in that wind chill, it's only feel, it's feeling more like zero. So uh, just taking a look at the radar right now, not a whole lot happening, but we are seeing some wet pavement. So some uh, showers or flurries or drizzle even uh, being reported for a lot of areas, especially through central in that onshore flow. This is very typical uh, for this time of year, or at least uh, when we start to see that onshore flow. But uh, as far as what we're going to see as we head through the night tonight, we could see some heavier bouts of snow, likely mixed with rain, though, for the next uh, couple of hours, if we do see that at all, then it should taper off uh, overnight, but hanging on to the chance of a few flurries through the overnight period. As far as the Avalon is concerned, this will likely mix with some rain or some showers uh, through the night and then up across Labrador. The uh, winds will shift a little bit, so we should see the end to that freezing drizzle, but still looking at that potential for uh, some flurries pretty much across the big land. Uh, and that's really about it. Nothing super significant weather wise tonight, but those winds will stay out of the northeast anywhere from 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. So temperatures will hover near or just below zero along the south coast. They should stay above zero uh, through the night tonight. Labrador, minus single digits for the most part, but Nain, he'll hover around minus 10 through uh, tonight. As we head into tomorrow, again, that northerly flow will stick around. Pretty quiet weather-wise, uh, nothing super significant, but we are looking at that chance of some flurries, maybe drizzle, freezing drizzle, depending on the temperatures. Uh, best chance of seeing that sunshine, the best weather will be away from that onshore flow tomorrow. Uh, so areas like the west coast, south coast, uh, and even southern Avalon may see uh, some breaks in the cloud cover tomorrow. As far as Labrador is concerned, chance of flurries will linger through the day. Then some weather will move in. Some light snow will move in uh, for western portions of Labrador through the night and then head towards uh, central areas as we get into early on uh, Friday morning. Now temperatures tomorrow again onshore flow those northerly winds means uh, that temperatures are going to stay quite chilly tomorrow. So 30 to 50 kilometer per hour winds, but temperatures hovering near or just below zero uh, or just above zero rather. But uh, away from that, though, temperatures reaching about two, three degrees, maybe a little bit more than that. But it will be unsettled uh, through the day. Uh, Twillingate, Gander, Grand Falls winds are all hovering around zero or a little bit above. Harbor Breton, two degrees with some cloudy periods through the afternoon. And as you head towards the west coast, this is where we should see some of the warmer, warmer, warmest air of uh, of Newfoundland uh, anywhere from four to five degrees through the day. Those northeasterlies will only be gusting around 20 kilometers per hour. Now the northern peninsula, southeastern Labrador, a fairly nice day tomorrow. Uh, you are looking at your temperatures within a couple of degrees of zero. Similar forecast for central uh, Labrador, two degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay. But again, that rain uh, snow rather will move in for Lab West as you hover around two degrees tomorrow. Winds generally light. Uh, now we're going to hang on to these mildish temperatures. This is well above where you should be sitting for this time of year, but I'll get into the long range when I come back. 
Thanks, Ashley. Well, it's a story that we've been following all week. Saltwire, the company that owns the Telegram, has filed for creditor protection, saying it has $94 million in debt. So what does this mean for the province's only daily newspaper? Earlier today, photo photojournalist Keith Goss, who's also the union rep for the staff at the Telegram, stopped by the On The Go studio to talk about it. We're waiting for the process to start unfolding and, uh, you know, just hoping that, uh, you know, we can keep on, you know, doing the jobs that we love. Honestly, I mean, we didn't think that it was, you know, at this point, uh, you know, we know that companies are hurting and, you know, we see companies closing down across the country. I mean, you know, you look at Metroland and, you know, Bell laying off people. I don't think anybody can consider themselves, you know, safe when you're a journalist or a photojournalist these days. We kind of knew that there's some issues, but uh, we didn't think it was quite uh, this bad. Our future is kind of uh, unsure as it is. Uh, I mean, I feel bad for the younger ones coming in because, uh, you know, they, they're they just, you know, literally out of school or, or just starting out their careers. And to, uh, you know, have a punch in the gut like this, uh, you know, in your first year or two of, uh, of doing a job that, you know, they're fired up to do uh, is, is not, it's, I mean, it's discouraging. Uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, three uh, younger journalists that we hired just recently, uh, one within the past few months. And, uh, you know, it's got to be uh, it's got to be pretty uh, discouraging for them to, uh, you know, enjoy doing their job and get into something that they dreamed of doing for such a long time. And next thing you know, uh, you know, they don't know if they're going to be uh, working at it uh, for much longer. The journalism scene these days is just uh, getting worse and worse and worse. And I'm not sure if people really realize what the loss of uh, local journalist is going to uh, do to their you know, communities and to you know, the, the country as a whole and, and democracy. Uh, I mean, you know, we, uh, you know, we investigate stuff, we keep people on their toes, we make sure that, uh, you know, politicians and businessmen are doing the right thing and not hiding stuff. I mean, we tell people stories. Uh, you know, it's so hard now to, uh, you know, tell, you know, uh, the story of someone in a small community in Newfoundland when you don't have anyone to send there. But, I mean, some stuff goes by the wayside and, you know, at some point, you know, if we're gone and uh, you're gone and, you know, the other TV station or radio station's gone, who's there to, you know, watch over everything? I don't think that we're seeing the end of the telegram as such. I mean, basically what we're waiting on right now is to make sh to find out whether, you know, the company's going to be given the, you know, the uh, creditor protection and, uh, you know, then we'll go from there. You know, we've been told here locally that it's business as usual, you know, just do your jobs and, uh, and get stuff done. And, uh, you know, we'll find out afterwards, uh, you know, what happens. People are, you know, talking on social media about, uh, well, sorry, sorry to see the telegram go. Well, we're still here and, you know, we're still hoping, you know, that we can keep on, uh, you know, and, and we're still hoping to stay here. Uh, you know, things don't look good, but, uh, you know, we're, we're always hopeful. <laughs> For some customers in St. John's, the deal seemed too good to be true, and now it turns out it was. Coming up, the results of an eight-month CBC News investigation into Atlantic Standard HVAC and the company's owner.
When a St. John's HVAC company abruptly closed last year, customers were worried. They couldn't get in touch with the business or learn the status of their promised 12-year warranty. And it seems they had every right to be concerned because unbeknownst to them, the owner of that company, Raymond Kalunga, was in legal and financial trouble elsewhere. Tonight, our CBC Investigates team is sharing the results of an eight-month investigation revealing a trail of debts, frustrated customers, broken promises and a warrant to take Kalanga into custody. Erin Kellant has this feature report. This is one of two heat pumps in Daphne Sheeb's home. She has two, something confirmed by this receipt, but up until last week was paying for three. So in October of this year, my first payment comes out and the payment that came out was for the $14,000 loan, not the $9,000 loan. Sheaves bought the units through Atlantic Standard HVAC, a St. John's heating and cooling company. But efforts to rectify the problem with the company went nowhere. In part, she says, because they were impossible to reach. That's a deal, you know, for 12 years, I pay now, I'm done. Edward Tolinar has a heat pump now, but not from Atlantic Standard. It almost was, though, enticed by the company's 12-year labor warranty. In early 2023, he decided to go for it. But after a handful of cancelled installation appointments and a last-minute change in his quote last winter, Tolinar says he became suspicious and decided to stop by Atlantic Standard's office. It was just abandoned, so we went home. And we were talking about it. I said, this is just not feeling correct, you know. Tolinar called the company financing the purchase just in case. And then she was asking, so you, there's nothing installed? I said, no, nothing installed. No equipment on site? I said, no, no equipment on site. And then I learned, she actually came and said, okay, we already paid the whole amount to Atlantic Standard on January 3rd. And she said, because on January 3rd, we received a form signed that installation was done. Luckily for him, he could quickly prove it was impossible the work was done, at least not then, because he got his mandatory inspection completed that very same day. But even some customers who did get their promised products are facing frustrations. Just noticed my machine rattling. So after looking underneath, there's no bolts put in any of the mount. I was having issues with my dehumidifier settings. Sometimes I get error codes that come up on my unit and, and I've had issues in the past where the unit just wouldn't work. It wouldn't be blowing or if it would be heating, it would be blowing cold air. If it was cooling, it would be blowing hot air. So this summer, Carly French started a Facebook page and quickly realized that she wasn't alone. Others also needed to access their warranty, but the company appeared to have gone underground. I'm constantly getting texts and calls and messages, and there's definitely a lot of very upset and very frustrated people. French says the financing company paid off her loan after extensive back and forth over issues with her machine. Meanwhile, the owner of Atlantic Standard says he paid it off. French says she's kept the Facebook page open so that customers have a place to communicate. <laughs> This is the man behind Atlantic Standard HVAC, 36-year-old Raymond Kalanga. The day's going well. Today was a tough day, I tell you that, Inky. His YouTube channel, a sea of motivation, bombast, and the art of the sale. People in this world, they either wait for an opportunity or they create their own opportunity. A lot of your decisions are all based on procrastination. We reached Kalanga by phone twice in January. When the wheels spin that fast, sometimes control is lost 
and you know things things don't go the way that we aspired for them to go. He said he was no longer taking on new Atlantic Standard customers, but was working hard to make things right for his existing ones, and had a deal with a third party to cover that 12-year labor warranty. One problem, the president of that company says no such agreement exists. Asked about that in a follow-up call this week, Kalonga indicated that work remains underway on a solution. There was very many satisfied customers, and from a portfolio of 1,000, you, you're probably going to find, yeah, 100 customers that have come together and, and stated that they're upset about X, Y, and Z, but you're also going to find 500 customers that are like, you know what, my service was top-notch. Raymond Kalonga chalked up the failure of Atlantic Standard HVAC to a multitude of issues, including the inability to retain quality employees and the unintended consequences of being a pioneer and offering customers 12 months, no interest, no payment. He also says he experienced racism from former employees and customers. He also says he went to police on multiple occasions and in one instance had his work vehicle vandalized with a racial slur. But he says that company debts and customers will be taken care of, about a thousand customers in total. There is not a company that I've had previously that whether it's restitution, whether it's um, outstanding invoices, whatever the case may be, have not come later on to be paid in full. That, it turns out, isn't true. You guys need to look to the person to right and left and say, I got your back. Because before there was Atlantic Standard HVAC in Newfoundland, there was Canadian Standard Home Services in Ontario. Different name, similar business, a company with a litany of outstanding debts. A former Canadian Standard employee is owed around $100,000. Porsche, over 82000 for the leasing of a luxury car without ever making payments. In Oshawa, Kalanga's company owes the Ontario Ministry of Labour over $30,000 in relation to employment standards. But the largest amount and the biggest legal problem for Kalanga came down just last month in an Ontario courtroom. Two weeks ago, Justice of the Peace Linda De Bartolo described Kalanga as deceitful. He and his former company faced dozens of charges under Ontario's Consumer Protection Act for door-to-door -door sales tactics that were false, deceptive and misleading and left some consumers with liens on their homes. And despite cutting a deal in 2019 to plead guilty and pay victims back $400,000, Kalonga returned a mere fraction, then stopped coming to court. Because of all of that, he was handed a $525,000 fine and sentenced to 525 days in jail. That's after the Crown attorney told the court that Mr. Kalonga has presumably left Ontario but remains a risk to Canadians. Back in Newfoundland, Kalonga faces more legal problems, another list of creditors. Garage owner Norman Nab was one of them, was owed over four grand for work he did on Kalonga's business vehicles, took him to small claims court and says he was eventually given these checks that the bank said were no good. They're mostly the ones you got to watch, the smooth talkers. Days after CBC contacted Kalonga about this story, Nab got his money back, in full, in cash. Others, not so lucky. A warrant of committal has been issued for Kalonga in Ontario for his detention and is now active. But Kalonga says he's not going to turn himself in. He says he missed court because of illness within his family and says it will all be sorted out. Kalonga says he intends to appeal. A decade ago, a younger Raymond Kalonga was cut a break, staring down a potential jail sentence after pleading guilty to conspiring to traffic cocaine. Kalonga convinced the judge he was reformed and on to bigger and better things in his life. The judge decided on house arrest instead of jail time. Two years of house arrest is not easy as well, but I feel that it's, it's quite credible because, of course, I'm not a danger to society. Now, 10 years later, Kalonga could be heading to jail anyway. You'll never see me back again. Ariana Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. And because it's based on actual real people, there's something really special about that. 
Well, who are the Radium Girls? Just ahead, we hear about the true story that's about to hit the LSPU Hall stage. The St. John's Players team is bringing the true story of the Radium Girls to stage at the LSPU Hall. A play called These Shining Lives tells the story of women in the 1920s who contracted radiation poisoning while working in a factory painting watches and clocks. The women later led a court battle against the Radium Company that paved the way for workers' rights today. Here's a look at the show. This isn't a fairy tale. Though it starts like one. It's not a tragedy, though it ends like one. It's something else. This play is a true story about a bunch of young women in the 1920s who, after World War I, uh, got work in a factory painting watch style faces. Now, during the war, the military had come up with a radium uh, paint that made paint glow. So they were thrilled. They were using it on all their airplane uh, dials and things like that. After World War I, it turned to the domestic market. So they were making alarm clocks and wristwatches. And young girls were hired because they had small, dainty hands and could paint the numbers on the dials. What they didn't know was that radium was poison. 
And these girls were dipping their paintbrushes in their mouths to sharpen them and then dipping them in the radium powder. So over about four to eight years, they all started showing signs of illness, which the company denied because the minute they got sick, the company fired them. Well, I play Catherine Donahue. It is a beautiful, uh, beautifully written piece of work. And um, the story, even though it is, you know, devastatingly sad, there's also these really beautiful moments in it. And because it's based on actual real people, there's something really special about that. You know, you can look up Catherine Donahue and Tom Donahue, and you can see pictures of their children. You can find pictures of Charlotte and Pearl and Francis, which are Catherine's friends. Uh, you can read all about their journey. And I think that's what makes the script so endearing to the actors, and I think it's what will make the story endearing to audiences. My mom is coming to stay with the babies during the day. She should be here any minute. Yeah, she's going to spoil them. Good. They should be spoiled. They're babies. You know, you've only ever worked part-time before. This eight hours a day stuff is not the same thing. I know. Work that pays well doesn't come cheap. Making good money costs you something. You? Sitting at a table all day? It might make it sound like fun, but work that pays well costs you something. Not this job. Everyone says it's a piece of cake. All the girls on the block applied for it. I just got lucky. A bunch of women from the Ottawa, Illinois factory decided to sue and took them to court. And it was outraged. How dare women do this and how dare they uh, try to... to you know, attack the company, but they won. So it was the first time really that a bunch of workers had successfully sued a company for um, damage that the company had done to their health. So in essence, workman's compensation. It's an important piece of history. I mean, the, the Radium Girls changed the face of workers' compensation um, and workers' rights. Uh, and I think that it's um, a very important story to bring to the forefront because it not only shows the power of women, but it also shows the power of the worker and that you know, you can fight against the powers that be and stand up for your own rights, and it may be really difficult, but little wins are big wins. God knows we all feel horrible about this whole mess. We can whine and cry about it till the cows come home. We have whined and cried about it till the cows came home. So do you mind if I make a suggestion? I think it depends. We on can whether... keep whining about it, or we can actually do something about it. Like what? I don't know, something gutsy. God knows we don't have much left to lose. But I also think it's a really important story to tell. And I want people to know more about Catherine Donahue and what she did and, you know, the revolution that she started for these women in the 20s and 30s. You see your story, beginning and middle, as they were written, and the end, as it comes. And once you've told it, then you can rest then you can go home. Your real work is done. I'm Catherine Wolfe Donahue, and I'm telling you now. Well, the play, These Shining Lives, will be on stage at the LSPU Hall in St. John's this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night, and then moves to Gander on April 6th. To the United States now, where Congress has passed a bill that could lead to a nationwide ban on the popular social media platform TikTok. They're concerned about its parent company's ties to the Chinese government and the security of American users. The bill now goes to the Senate. The CBC's Richard Madden has the latest from Washington. The rules are suspended. The bill is passed. In an overwhelming bipartisan majority, lawmakers in the House of Representatives voted to ban the wildly popular social media app TikTok in the U.S. unless it divests itself from its Chinese-owned parent company within six months. TikTok is a threat to our national security because it is owned by ByteDance, which does the bidding of the Chinese Communist Party. We know this because ByteDance leadership says so and because Chinese law requires it. In a rare show of unity, both Democrats and Republicans mostly voted in favor, with some opponents warning the move is government outreach. The bill is written so broadly that the president could abuse that discretion and include other companies that aren't just social media companies. Keep TikTok! Keep TikTok! Outside Capitol Hill, TikTok supporters and influencers protested the vote, saying banning TikTok bans freedom of expression and hurts the economy. 
This app is so much more than just an app for dumb TikTok dances. This is a life-changing app. So many people, not only 5 million small businesses rely on it, but 170 million people rely on this app for more than just their livelihood. The controversial bill now heads to the Senate where its fate is unclear. TikTok plans to aggressively lobby senators to reverse course. I still have concerns about naming a specific company in legislation, but it feels like this House bill has momentum. Now, some senators warn you don't win elections by cutting out a large group of young voters who are big fans of the social media app. President Joe Biden has said he would sign a law banning TikTok if it's passed in Congress, while former President Trump, who pushed for a ban in office, is now opposed. Richard Madden, CBC News, Washington. Color. One seal buyer operates in the province and that puts the hunt in a precarious situation. Watch part one of an appeal for seal, Sunday at 11.30 and Monday at 7. Okay, we're into the long range forecast now and uh, looking ahead to the weekend. 
<laughs> Almost there. <laughs> thought it was Thursday all day today. It's the worst. It's not Thursday. Yeah, yeah. but we are going to look at Thursday evening into Friday's forecast. Let's take a look at that. Uh, we've got some unsettled conditions, but it's there's really not a whole lot happening weather-wise. We're just going to continue to see that onshore flow, which means, uh, you know, some peaks of sun in some cases, but uh, the chances some flurries or drizzle will continue as we head through the day on Friday. Then we've got a little disturbance moving through Labrador, and this is going to bring some light snow. Uh, not too much, but you could pick up a couple of centimeters. And by the time we get into the afternoon hours, that snow will move towards Happy Valley Goose Bay and uh, up across northern portions of Labrador and then across the island. Like I said, just the chance of some uh, flurries or maybe some showers through the day, depending on your temperature. So we will see those temperatures. It looks like a little bit below zero further east and then near or above uh, a couple of degrees above zero for central and eastern portions, uh, central and western portions of the island for your Friday Labrador. Generally minus single digits, except around Happy Valley Goose Bay, where you, were, where you will hover around plus two. So as we head into the evening hours and then and then into Saturday morning, we're looking at that snow moving towards the coast. Again, light snow, but you could pick up a couple centimeters with this as it moves ahead. And uh, Saturday overall looking uh, like cloudy, uh, certainly across the island. Uh, we may see a few peaks of sun, but we're going to hang on to that onshore flow, that northerly flow, which will again keep those temperatures cool and uh, maybe even the chance of a few flurries uh, for the west coast as well as the south coast of the island. But again, temperatures really not moving a whole lot, generally hovering uh, somewhere uh, a couple of degrees above zero for the most part for your Saturday and Labrador. You're not seeing too much movement in your temperatures either. In fact, you should stay above zero uh, for Happy Valley Goose Bay. So the long range forecast, <laughs> when I say your temperatures aren't moving much, I really mean it uh, around one degree Saturday, Sunday and Monday. Uh, but we are looking at the potential for some flurries by the time we get to the end of the week and then the beginning of next week. Uh, but we should see some sunshine as well. Our overnight lows will be hovering uh, just below zero, anywhere from about one to four degrees below zero for the week. And then for central Newfoundland, flurries, a little bit more sunshine possible, though, for Saturday and Sunday through central as your temperatures hover around three or four degrees and your overnight lows dipping uh, into the mid minus single digits, warming up a little bit by the time we get into Monday. And then for eastern uh, Newfoundland, you are looking at your temperatures between two and four as well. Really, uh, Sunday looking cloudy at this point. You may see a few peaks of sun, but overall unsettled uh, through to Monday. Eastern Labrador, a few flurries certainly possible right through to Monday with your temperatures one, two degrees and then just a little bit below that for Western Labrador. Uh, Sunday looks cloudy at this point, but you might see some sun by the time we get into Sunday. Now, speaking of uh, Wa or Lab West, this is a fog bow in Wabush. Steve sent me this photo. You can see a little bit, looks like you see a little bit of uh, some color there to the on the outside of that. But yeah, fog bow. Very interesting. Thank you so much for that great shot. If you have any weather photos that you would like to share with us, you can send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. A fog bow. I don't see a lot of fog around. That's a, yeah, there's fog there. You can see it in the further, like further out. But basically it's just um, little tiny little water droplets that the uh, sun is refracting. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, very nice. You'd ha you can't see you if you're in full fog, you won't see the fog bow. So it has to be around. Not as vibrant as a rainbow. rainbow. Yeah. yeah, exactly. They're smaller, much smaller raindrops. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> pretty quiet weather wise. It seems it's nice for you to have a little bit of a break. Yes, I will. I will certainly take it. Hopefully it doesn't get too busy in the near future, but it is only March. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it for us. Thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. Good night.